Hello, welcome to Analyze This, Mr. Bond. This is part two of a five-part series. Part one was focused on Casino Royale. This will be focused on Quantum of Solace, and the next three episodes will focus on the remainder of the Craig series. I'm taking a look at Daniel Craig's James Bond, his psychology, and the way that plays out with the themes of each movie. Um, and my broader argument here is that there is a fair level of consistency in the way the character develops over these movies, um, and that it starts in Casino Royale with the introduction that was very new for the series of this sort of bifurcation in the character of James Bond, that he becomes a little bit more like Batman, where there is James Bond the man, and then there is James Bond 007, this sort of secret agent persona he adopts to... Uh, both perform his his duties as a as a secret agent, but also to protect himself emotionally from the world around him. Um, it's it's very much this sort of uh, psychological bifurcation, and I think in the next few movies, especially starting with Quantum of Solace, we see that this is a man who is perpetually at war with himself, who is perpetually at odds with the idea of being a secret agent. And Quantum of Solace is really the movie that cements the idea that trauma is going to be so central to Daniel Craig's James Bond, that uh, Daniel Craig's James Bond is forever kind of dealing with complex emotional states. And I, I think from a, a, a non... Uh, not from a thematic perspective, but just from why they did this. I think Daniel Craig's portrayal of James Bond in Casino Royale was so uh, gripping and vivid that they kept wanting to give him things to sink his teeth into. But I think it also just is building naturally and organically off this narrative that they've introduced in Casino Royale a little bit more subtly than in later movies where he's an orphan and he is dealing with that trauma by embedding himself in the surrogate family of the British government. And M is this surrogate mother figure that he has a very complicated uh, love-hate relationship with. And they a lot of trust issues between the two of them. And he's continually working that out and is also continually uh, processing what it would look like to leave his role as a secret agent and explore what it would mean to be uh, a man outside of the 007 persona and quantum of sauce puts that right front and center it could have moved on after casino royale and started to put vesper in the rear view mirror but it puts vesper front and center this is uh in in some ways bond's arc over the course of quantum of solace is he's he's a bit like uh a man who had a very bad breakup and has become a workaholic as a result because he doesn't want to deal with those difficult emotions. That's sort of where Bond's headspace is at in Quantum of Solace. He's throwing himself into his work as a way to escape and not process his emotional reality. And um, his arc over the movie is both learning to let people in to help him uh, work through that and then it is also to take a step back and see that his particular area of focus is, is just one piece of a broader narrative. Um, one of the ways that director Mark Forster sort of embeds that into the movie, and I, I don't think it's completely successful because I don't think this always lands, but it, it does it enough in the movie that you really have to respect it as very intentional is this idea that um, Bond's investigation into quantum, his pursuit of the people who uh, manipulated Vesper, is just his focus and that there's a broader world at play beyond the, the scope of his vision. And Quantum of Solace introduces this idea very early on by having uh, a bystander get shot during the Sienna chase. And then the chase keeps cutting back to the aftermath of that, even though James Bond is off doing other things. It's to kind of 
let the that sort of death linger and that and you see this happen again is like uh bond will be traveling through a town and it's going to focus on the the poverty of the inhabitants or um you know bond and camille are walking through the desert and then it focuses on the people who are suffering at the hands of the of of quantum sinister plot to uh manipulate the world's water supply that that you're really seeing this this scope of experience outside the frame of James Bond and and that's very interesting because usually James Bond adventures are mostly seen through uh Bond's eyes occasionally you might cut to like the villain doing activities but it's it's usually singularly focused on it and Quantum of Solace is very much about opening up the world a little bit this is a a world that exists around James Bond um, and James Bond's single-minded focus is very much the story, especially of the first part of this movie. And the way it's primarily playing out is in his relationship with M. Um, he kind of shuts M out. Um, and she doesn't have a sense for what he's doing as he's chasing uh, down Quantum. Um, from the outside, it looks like he's just completely gone a loose, can't gone off is a loose cannon, is reckless. And when we see the actual links in the chain, that's not exactly what's happening. Bond is being as savage and uh, blunt as ever, you know, uh, a pretty brutal, blunt instrument of a secret agent, for sure. But he's mostly just not communicating um, back with M or anybody that might be able to help him um, manage this conspiracy. In fact, he's purposely keeping M in the dark too. We see him swipe the the Vesper photograph in their first real conversation in the movie, um, in a way that he doesn't want her to know that he is still vulnerable. Um, and this happens too again with uh, his friendship with Mathis. He pulls Mathis into the story, um, and their relationship is 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 interesting in the sense that Mathis is able to get a little bit under Bond's skin, but Bond is still keeping him at distance. And the most charitable way I can read Mathis's death scene in this movie, which I have to just take a, a, a brief moment to rant about this, because as much as I've come to appreciate Quantum of Solace, I think Mathis's death scene is probably, objectively speaking, the worst written scene in the franchise it is just so confusing and jerky and you have this weird dialogue about uh is was mathis your code name that doesn't really mean anything um and then bond drops him in a dumpster at the end and it's not clear what the takeaway is supposed to be there the most charitable way i can read that is it's it's bond pulling back from a moment of very real emotional vulnerability to kind of say, um, you know, to just focus exclusively on the mission to the point of, like, just cutting himself off from Mathis. He just can't deal with that emotional vulnerability at that moment. And uh, and maybe that was really what was truly intended by the scene, because it, it does come as such a, a shock, and it is obviously such a a potent image that Mathis's body is just left in a dumpster and it feels very um, ruthless even for Bond. It's so ruthless that even Camille is is standing there saying like, uh, what are you doing? Um, and Bond eventually does start to let people in. Um, he lets M in. M and Bond have a confrontation where they both realize they're kind of uh, missing pieces of the, the puzzle and have their sort of uh, collaborative moment. Bond reconnects with Felix Leiter that helps him in the third act and that sort of outreach. Um, and then obviously his relationship with Camille. And Camille is very interesting in the sense that uh, she is reinforcing the idea that family is so centric to um, these movies. She is a victim of great tragedy she lost her family and is on the hunt for revenge. And in many ways that mirrors what is going on with Bond. Bond has two real motivations over the course of Quantum of Solace. One is 
to get answers from Vesper, and one is also to follow up on the attempted assassination of M. He talks about uh, M, you know, being sort of a mother figure to Camille. He talks to M about, like, he's looking for the people who tried to kill her. Um, and that sort of dual arc there is very loaded with with family connotations. Vesper was the person he could have formed a life with outside of MI6. She could have become his family that was taken from him. Uh, M is the figurehead of his uh, his relationship now. And it's uh, this is something that's very interesting that I don't know how to quite fit into this argument, but I just want to make this observation clear. It's interesting how often... Um, how often uh, Bond and M are having, you know, very intimate conversations in like domestic areas. Bond breaks into her apartment. He also breaks into her home in Skyfall. Uh, they have a very big conversation here in like Mitchell's house with M talking about like gifts she gave Mitchell. It's, there's a very sort of like strong intimate relationship between the two of them that's very unusual in the co course of the series. Obviously we've seen and visit Bond's apartment in like Live and Let Die, but the, that whole sequence in Live and Let Die is is making a joke about how awkward it is for Bond and M to be in this space. Whereas for C Craig's Bond and Dench's M, it feels a lot more natural for them to be in this sort of uh, intimate space. So Bond is working through this, you know, violence that has been inflicted on that on him um, in his in his loss of his uh, his chance at an alternate life and also now um, a threat to his his current you know surrogate family and Camille comes in and she has lost her entire family and she is just singly single-mindedly focused on revenge and Bond is going to help her get it and she's going to help him get the answers he needs but their acts their arcs flow in parallel in a very direct way. And Camille ultimately starts to, to function as, like Vesper did, uh, a sort of potential window for Bond to uh, emotionally connect with someone. Um, there's a bit of trauma bonding going on between the two of them, no pun intended, uh, where they are really brought together just because of their shared experience of loss and the alignment in the targets they're, they're going after. Um, they're, I, I'm gonna talk about the, the climax in a, in a second here because I think the climax of Quantum of Sauce is profoundly dark and complicated in ways that Bond fans don't talk about. Um, but I think, I think that final scene between Camille and Bond, uh, when they are at the train station and they're in the car talking, is one of the more raw and vulnerable moments for Daniel Craig's James Bond. In the course of the series, we see a lot of moments for him where he's kind of... Uh, unvarnished right and it's worth mentioning that Quan Mo Salas is the first Bond film to actually let Bond really get drunk that scene with him and Mathis on the plane where Bond is is just you know just absolutely uh trashed so to speak is is very vulnerable for the character and also very unusual in the way that it starts to undercut the fantasy of James Bond which is you know this guy can put away many drunk, as many drinks as he wants and he never gets a hangover. Now, Quantum of Solace plays it both ways. That's one of the problems with this movie, which is, you know, he can get drunk on a plane and still looks flawless the next morning. And you kind of get a sense of that that's sabotaging the drama a little bit, or at least it does for me. Um, but the moment with him and Camille in the car is one of the moments where, where Bond really feels like the most... Uh, kind of unstable, right? The, there's a there's a recurring feature of Daniel Craig's James Bond is that the the way he he sort of approaches women romantically or seductively is often a little bit creepy, sometimes intentionally and probably sometimes not as intentionally as the filmmakers intended. But that moment is particularly kind of 
um, uncomfortable. The way he just kind of like forces that kiss on Camille is like so potent with desperation. He is just acting out of pure instinct. And that's a very interesting, vulnerable moment that speaks very well to the, the headspace of this character. He's 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 such a mess, and he's just kind of reaching for whatever lifeline he has, whether it's the the quest for quantum, or whether it's this chance that he might be able to form this connection with Camille that might put some of his demons to rest. And Camille is thankfully smart enough to tell him that you know. I'm not going to be able to save you. Um, and then, you know, and that's that. And then the two part their ways and never see each other again. Um, their climax together is kind of like a, a dual course of revenge. And I think the climax is darker and in many ways more uncomfortable and somewhat depressing than uh, any other sequence in the Daniel Craig movies, at least for me. I, I don't think all Bond fans have felt this way, but I have, ever since seeing it in theaters, have always felt that that climax was kind of a very uncomfortable uh, gut punch of a sequence. I don't think it's in the best of taste the way it foregrounds um, the assault of the, the waitress by Medrano and uses that as a, a key setup point for, for what is a big action climax. I I, uh, I'm i not very comfortable with the way that it puts that kind of uh, trauma and violence into what is still essentially at, at core a, a sort of James Bond fantasy. And it, the movie doesn't really want to reckon with that in the way that it should, but it, it, it pulls that same traumatic energy into Camille's confrontation with General Medrano, which uh, is, is just sort of brutal and ruthless and she kills Medrano using Bond's advice but is immediately after her victory kind of trapped by her trapped there and the, metaphorically we might say she's kind of like trapped by the trauma she's in in trapped by the flames around her um and Bond who has done you know participated in his own confrontation at the time and has gotten to answers like drops what he's doing, drops his own personal crusade to help Camille. But what that moment is, is, is so dark for both of them in the sense that they are both together and Bond is, is brought to the very brink of just kind of giving up for both of them. Uh, just ending it for both of them to give them an out so that they, they don't uh, suffer as they pass. And that is such a dark choice and such a dark moment for this Bond. We talked a little bit in Casino Royale how that he's introduced in that conversation with M as having this sort of death wish. Like he knows what he's signed up for in this profession. And that's, that's the closest until No Time to Die where he really comes uh, close, close to that line. Um, and and the way it's contextualized in Quantum of Solace is, is 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 pretty dark and nasty. And that moment uh, is so kind of bleak for me. And of course, Bond finds a way out at the last second and then is back to being Bond on a, a mission again, chasing down leads with Dominic Green. But the that that moment where Bond is just about to give up on everything to the point of even giving Camille her release um, is thematically very bleak to me and is perhaps the bleakest expression across all five of these movies of, of Bond's innate sort of uh, self-destructive capacity that he's, he's kind of um, in this, you know, his, his, his willingness to accept death and accept the responsibility not just of, of being a bringer of death to evil but like uh just kind of like bringing death to himself and others um even as an act of mercy it's just i don't know that i find that very thematically thorny um but 
you know, his relationship with Camille resolves dramatically, and then he moves on to the confrontation with uh, Vesper's boyfriend, which is really just a moment of uh, personal catharsis in the sense that Bond is finally able to come face to face with this man, but he's he understands in that moment that Vesper's part of a bigger pattern that the story of Vesper is a bigger story and that he needs to let his personal stake in it go in order for uh, more resolution. So um, he, he saves a surrogate Vesper figure in that moment uh, in ways giving him a little bit of emotional closure and then uh, has his final chat with M that sort of resolves the story to a point which is that you know from bond's perspective he was always in the midst of of you know chasing down what he'd been assigned to to, to chase down which is to to f figure out the big picture this is the the thematic idea that was introduced in casino royale and he's found it and visually directly leaves vesper behind at the end of this movie now, uh, when we see, you know, subsequent movies, we'll find out that Vesper is very much not left behind for the film series. Again, this was a moment where potentially Vesper could have been uh, left behind as backstory and the series might have moved forward onto other things. We'll find out that's not really the case for Daniel Craig's Bond. Vesper is always looming large for him. But... Uh, to, if I have to summarize my position here in Quantum of Solace, it's that <clears throat> as a statement of character for this James Bond, it's very much about how, how this Bond responds to trauma. This is the most single-mindedly uh, quest for vengeance-y story we have for James Bond. Um, Sure, we had License to Kill, but this is even more directly focused on Bond's emotional state, his emotional rawness. And we see that in these moments of kind of personal confusion, uh, this Bond tends to lose himself. And that's a theme that, you know, we'll, we'll revisit when we talk about Skyfall in the next episode. Let me know what you feel about Quantum of Solace, how successful you think it is in fleshing out Bond's psychology and journey across the course of the film. Um, I, as have noted, have kind of complex feelings about the movie myself, but I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. Um, and let me know uh, if there's anything you disagreed with. Uh, happy to engage with you in the comments. Other than that, I've been chatting for long enough. This video is going on a little bit longer than even the Casino Royale video did. So I'll leave it here and I'll catch you in the next one.